Welcome to the Fantasy NASCAR Podcast. I am Race for the Prize. We're looking at the Xfinity Series at Coda and checking the salaries early in the week. We want to find some value at the bottom. We also want to find some value at the top. They may not be cheap at the top, but we could project some good point per dollar plays or we're simply finding the best top five guys in the expensive range. Who can get a top five in the expensive tier? We're going to need them in our lineups. We'll start at the bottom with Brad Perez running for Tommy Joe Martins. So we're looking at the mid-pack. Who can elevate to the top of the mid-pack? Who can run around 25th and then benefit from attrition? All the issues that go down to the road course, obviously course cutting, obviously turn one at Coda can be crazy. So when we're looking at some of these value drivers, we're asking ourselves, does the equipment, does the talent, allow for an average running position of 25th or even 20th, then we can bake in some added attrition of five spots on the grid. Maybe they can get to 15th or 10th. And depending on their starting position, they will become the value play that we want. Can Tommy Joe Martin's truck get or car get this done? Yes, it can. Now, this will be a little bit longer of a podcast. I try to be as succinct and to the point to help you out. But we're going to look at some unfamiliar names. We're going to look at some drivers that are getting experience, that are from different disciplines, and that requires us to click around on random websites and racing reference and to look and see what some of these guys have done in various series. Does Perez have Xfinity road course experience? We'll look real quick. Watkins Glen, a 20th for Gase. That's actually surprising. One of the things that worries me this week is can the Gase equipment get it done? And Perez got the 20th at Watkins Glen for Gase. 23rd, uh, 29th at Austin, 29th. So a lot of road course experience in the Xfinity series. Obviously, we could just have looked that up on the spreadsheet right here. But at least we know his equipment was with Gase. And then Tommy Joe Martins actually got that 19th at Road America for Tommy Joe Martins. His best equipment, got his best to finish. And again, he is in good equipment. We'll see what he did in the Arca series. I know it's digging deep for a lot of these guys, but it's worth looking at. And we'll also want to look at his trucks, see if he's done any road course trucking. Uh, Austin, 2022, finished 20th for Rayum, so not the greatest truck. 22nd for Rayum, not the greatest truck. You know, I'm a little bit more into Rayum this year, if you've been listening to the podcast, but last season, they weren't that great. No one was arguing in 2022 that Josh Rayum had really solid trucks. And so for Brad Perez to put together these results, that's pretty exciting. And we might as well look at his ARCA runs too. I'm assuming these are road courses in 21 and 2024 since he did a lot of that in the truck series. Sure enough, 24th, running for Josh Williams. Not bad. I think that this is a misprice. Brad Perez has plenty of road course experience. He has produced results. I think he absolutely can do it. At 4,500, I don't know why he's the cheapest guy. I also think Blaine Perkins can get you there too. Blaine Perkins has success at road courses. Some flat track experience at Martinsville. You know, maybe it's breaking on off throttle time. You've heard me talk about it before. Intermediate tracks have never been his cup of tea. He is in a seed car, which is, uh, you know, the top tier of the mid pack. Not the best in the mid-pack, but it's right there. It's competitive. It's clearly a 20th to 25th place car. Perkins has demonstrated that he can get top 20s. This was pretty good equipment last year with our motorsports. Maybe a step down in equipment, but he has been good at road courses even deeper in his past. If I'm not mistaken, he has that win at Tool out in Utah in the Arca West series. Let me pull that up just to double check for you folks. Three wins, and I'm pretty sure that's going to be it. We'll look it up. Mark the West. There it is. Race two at Tool in 2020. He got the win. I guess that's exciting. You know, make of that what you want. It is kind of a random road course race out there west, but he navigated the turns, got the job done. And Ellis is there if you want to go there. If if this Tommy Joe Martin's car can be in 25th, so can Ellis. And Ellis has been close to optimal in the past. But I like Perkins and Perez better. Um, obviously, a deciding factor would be if Ellis was starting much further to the back. 
then I guess he would be a much more interesting play. But let's not get greedy. At these prices, we don't really need a lot of place differential. At 4,600, I don't need Perkins starting dead last. At 4,500, I don't need Perez starting dead last. When we get in the 6,000 range, yeah, I'm going to ask for a little bit more place differential for point per dollars. But also, because I really want to nail a lot of guys in the top 10, because finishing position is so vital. I mean, again, I'm not really worried about fast laps or laps led. I'm looking at finishing position. And I'll take as the breaker getting some place differential out of this top tier, but they're going to be expensive. I'm going to have to spend up. But it's not as hard to do if I take one of these guys at the bare minimum. I take two at the bare minimum. That's great. I know people are going to say, oh, I can double punt because I kind of like these guys. And while you might end up with some pretty good point per dollar plays, having only four drivers in the top 10, because we're not going to get a top 10 likely out of Perez. We're not going to get maximized finishing position out of Blaine Perkins. If I just take one of them, I think if I am smart, I can also get five drivers inside the top 10. If you take two of them and they could be good value plays, then you can nail your other four picks, but you only have four drivers in the top 10. I have five. My line is probably going to beat yours. Also, if I've got five very solid drivers as opposed to your four and two, then I'm more likely to nail the lap leader, just probability perspective. Going back down and looking at some of these values. Leland Honeyman, no road course experience. We like what we've seen out of the young car this year. Young's been really strong at the road courses and the trucks. But um, we'll throw this out there. Since Young is bringing a lot of trucks to the track this year, uh, maybe the Xfinity race is not receiving as much resources. He doesn't have as much experience. Not a favorite down here. Patrick Gallagher, road course race. So here it is. This is where the podcast and why the podcast will take a little bit longer because we want to dig into these guys and find out a little bit more about them. Sports car racer, plenty of experience. Got some really solid wins here and finishes in different uh, throughout the years. Halfway decent run here in the WeatherTech series. And we look and see his results. Haven't been too bad in the Xfinity series in the past. 19th Road America, 22nd at Circuit of the Americas, running for Sieg. He could be someone you can consider. I haven't even seen him on the official entry list, but he is in the DraftKings pool. I'm assuming he's with Sieg again. Didn't run last year, but in 2020-22, he did get a 22nd place finish at Coda, a 19th place finish at Road America. If he is starting in the back, he's definitely in play. I like Perkins and Perez a little bit more, but there's no reason not to like Gallagher. His resume is just as strong, and he does have experience. But it is comparable, again, to what we saw out of Brad Perez. Perez actually had a better average finish in 2022 at the road courses than Gallagher. Haley Deegan, not going to be on board this week. You can look and see what her results were in the truck series. This just is not going to be the week that I am that encouraged roster. Kyle Weatherman's always been a pretty solid road course racer. As you can see, average finish 20th, pretty good. Gosselin always puts together really good road course equipment. We've seen Gosselin field extra cars with Ross Chastain to nearly win this race. We've seen Gosselin and Alex LeBay, who is a very talented road course driver, put together really good results. 5,400, he's definitely on the board. And you may not need to go with extreme savings. And if Weatherman can get you a little bit more place differential, that's definitely a place to go. Preston Partis is a very solid young road course racer. We've seen him put together pretty good results outside of this discipline. He's put together some pretty good results within the Xfinity series. The only thing that's going to worry you is that a lot of these good results were with better equipment. We're with, I believe, Goslin. We'll just go ahead and double check that. I can get that on screen for you since I've got the link provided. Again, sorry that this one isn't going to be as succinct, but I want to do the work for you. I want to do the research for you so that you don't have to, and then I'll explain the other reason why I'm doing this. So we put together his Xfinity races. And if you want to do this on your own, a lot of times you just sort by laps. It's the easiest way to get to the road courses, although all of his are going to be road courses. You sort by laps because there's fewer laps in these races. Yeah, Goslin and Dodder are mainly his rides. The times that he ran in his own equipment, which he will be in, he had a failure at Road America 
in 2019. And then the other time, he finished 27th at the Roval in his own equipment. He will again be in his own equipment. That is a concern. So I like Pardis as a road course driver, running well in the NMX 5 Cup, but in his own equipment, I worry. Austin Green, new on the scene. Let's pull him up. And so the thing that I wanted to say about looking these things up is I'm doing the research so you don't have to. You're gonna do some research on your own. And because you do this special research, you're gonna fall in love with the driver and feel like you have an edge and play them. And that may not necessarily be the case. Just because you did extra research doesn't mean that pick is better. Just because you did a little bit of extra research doesn't mean you have an edge on the field. I've fallen into that trap plenty of times. Sometimes it works, it does. And maybe you'll hit on something this week, but just be careful when you are doing that. So he is currently a Trans Am full-time driver, young kid. Looks like he has decent experience. See some of these Trans Am results, they don't have them on there. I don't really feel like reading through his dialogue. His best finish was 12th of Watkins Glen, so not really the greatest driver ever. But he does have road course experience. The big thing that you're going to like about Austin Green is that it is a Jordan Anderson car, and the Jordan Anderson cars have performed well at the road courses in their short stint so far in the Xfinity Series. And a 5600 for Jordan Anderson car is definitely in play. I think I'd rather go with Weatherman or take the extreme savings with Perkins and Perez. Balicki, good road course driver, never always in the best equipment. Goslin is not the best in the mid pack, but again, halfway decent in the road courses. His finishes, pretty solid, average finish 21st last year. Got some top 20s here. We know about Josh Balicki, the road course driver, grinding it out, getting rides every week. As far as cheap, Road course drivers in the Xfinity series. He's definitely one of the guys that we want to think about. We like him maybe a little bit more than Kyle Weatherman. They're both there in that kind of same grading level. Definitely in play. If you don't want to go to Perkins or Perez, Gallagher is scary. I skipped over Brennan Poole. Brennan Poole was optimal last year. Not last year at Coda. Uh, one of these road courses. I think at the Roval, yeah. Ran in 25th and through attrition. And that's really the story when we're picking in the truck series and the Xfinity series. Can these guys in the mid pack or in the truck series in the backpack hang around 25th to 20th and then through attrition and with the events that unfold at Coda, like turn one being turn one, then through the misfortune of others, you bake in five extra grid spots and they finish almost in the top 15 with double digit place differential. And just about any of these guys can work. Poole is not a favorite of mine, but he does have better equipment this time around than JD. But he produced in JD, should be able to produce it at Tommy Joe Martins. Not that there is too much of a degree of difference. But Tommy Joe Martins every year gets a little bit better. And I don't think JD Motorsports has really improved much. If anything, they have declined. They're both right there in the middle of the mid pack. Can he be in contention? Yeah, he'll likely be on the lead lap. He'll be within striking distance. He is only 5,100. As far as talent, you would much rather go with Weatherman and Balicki also in equipment. RC, can't remember who exactly. I haven't seen the official entry list who he's running for. A lot of old school experience. I'm not really that interested in rostering the guy. Let's see, at his last time he was in the series, didn't run in 2023, nothing in 2022. I know he's popped up occasionally once upon a time. There it is, Road America, he got a ride, 20th. Not really something that I need to go to. Ed Jones is gonna be in pretty solid equipment. Ed Jones has some old school IndyCar experience. He may be running recently in IMSA. Let's look that up. Now we're gonna to go to his racing reference instead. Got a truck race last year. I'm assuming this is at Coda. And I'm right, and he finished last in a young truck, which we like, but he had a mechanical issue. Ouch. But you can Google him up. Plenty of experience in the past at other disciplines. Hunt, vehicle, which we like. He is in play, but 
I'm obviously targeting some of these other guys that have actual more experience, more experience with their team, are there every week. We'll see what he does in practice. But right now, he's not really someone that I'm targeting. Brian Sieg is really cheap. Plenty of experience. He can get it done. If we're just asking him to run around 20th, then normally we would ask a little bit more out of Sieg. But because his salary is so cheap this week, we kind of have to reframe what we want from Ryan Sieg. And this is a significant discount for a driver with a lot of experience. It's not really good experience, but he does have the best seat car. Uh, depending on where he starts, we might not need much from him. But then, you know, we look at Parker Rett's lab and we get a pretty good road course driver in pretty good equipment who produced last year at Coda. And at Coda last year, this wasn't really magic. He started in the back and drove himself to the front and really didn't benefit too much from attrition and gains he did it the work on his own talented young driver at 6200 way too cheap and i think this is a misprice so i like this play a lot uh, if i still feel like we're going to end up down here because we're chasing a lot of guys in the top 10 but legitimately he could get you a top 15 and so maybe you got a cheap guy and you got parker retzlav and then you get four top tens because the guys in the top 10, the top three, are very expensive, Retzlaff might be the way to maximize finishing position down in the cheap spots. You could also consider Jeremy Clements, who also had a good race at Coda. Average finish last year, 22nd, 18th. That means he's going to be in striking distance. That means he can easily get to 15th by the end of the race. Good races at Daytona. You can go way back and find that he won at Road America once upon a time. If you have access to the Fancy NASCAR spreadsheet, you can look at all these races. All of these races. Racefortrise.com, 10 bucks for the week. Or we can prorate you for the month. We'll figure it out. We've got the F1, former Red Bull driver who really never did much. He is going to be with Daughter. We've seen Daughter SHR cars perform well at Coda, but not just straight Daughter cars. But daughter cars have been halfway decent, as we mentioned before, with um, before talking about Perkins having solid results. We'll see what, I think it's Kiat. Forgive me if I cannot pronounce every F1 driver's name ever. My apologies. But 6,400 for an experienced driver. We're gonna wanna see what he does in practice. We wanna see what this car is capable of. And if we're holding all these other guys to the standard of a candy hang around the 25th, that's really what we want to see in practice and qualifying. And then we can make our decision from there. But we definitely cannot rule out a, you know, a former F1 driver at 6,400 and not too bad equipment. I had worries before about the Gase equipment, but we, as we have seen by investigating that the Gase equipment has been halfway decent at the road courses. So that makes me feel a little bit more comfortable. Alex LeBay. Is a good road course driver, 6,500. We had paid 8,000 for Alex Obey at Gossam before at a road course. Now we do have to factor in that in some of those road course races where LeBay was expensive, he was competing against some pretty solid talent. Either way, the results don't lie. Average finish of 19th, some really solid top 15s, same thing in 2022. And you're gonna see plenty of that as you go through that LeBay knows what he's doing from the Pinty series, running a lot of road courses in stock cars. So he has, he's not like Kiat, hope I'm saying that right, who has F1 road course experience. LeVay has actual stock car experience and win. Now it is the Pinty series, but he knows how to navigate a stock car on a road course. Maybe you consider Jeb Burton. I'm not really there. Burton's just never really been a good road course driver. We do like the car, but there are cheaper, better options. Ty Dillon jumping into JD. This is just a... Name recognition price, it's going to be a no for me. Josh Williams has been halfway decent. Scored quite a few road course optimal lineups in the past by just hanging around and winning on attrition, but he was always cheaper. Now, he will have a better ride at Colic, who has really good road course cars. But at 7000 I don't know if he provides maximum savings, and he's not necessarily a road course whiz. Kara, the, uh, the IndyCar guy that never did really much. Also in a hunt car, 7,200. I don't think I need to go here. Has not been too impressive in his runs. Always has halfway decent equipment in most of these series and still just an average of 23rd and 22nd. 
you want to go to Karim, that's fine. You want to click on his name, that's fine. You're going to find some lackluster IndyCar performances. Anthony Alfredo at 7,400. Our cars are pretty good. I think he knows what he's doing. Um, you're just paying a little bit too much, I think, at this point, and not really having the certainty of a top 10. Because right here with Jones, I can legitimately argue for a top 10, just a little bit more, much better equipment. Jones also has shown the knack for not qualifying well and then finishing well. Tons of stock car experience, never been that great, but quite a few optimal lineups, quite a few top 10 DFS days at the road courses at 7,600. His price is down just because the top is so heavy. We can definitely work him into lineups. You never feel comfortable rostering Brandon Jones. But look, 11th at Coda, 13th at Portland, 10th at Road America. If he gets you double-digit place differential at 7,600 and gets that finish, then we're fine. We don't necessarily need a top 10 out of Jones if we can bake in some place differential. And he easily will fit in a lineup with one of these punts and give you plenty of room to take four guys at the top. Same thing for Casgrala. Maybe some slight concerns with the SIG equipment. But Casgrala, probably an above average road course racer, a good cup series race once upon a time, put together some pretty good results. Although this, I believe, was mainly with a Hunt, so had a little bit better, or maybe an hour as well, better equipment in these races. But he knows how to run these races. He's definitely gonna be someone that is in play, just like Brandon Jones fits into the mold. Same thing for Riley Herbst. Price is depreciated. We know it's a quality ride. We have seen him run well at these courses before. He never really gets you that excited. I would argue that this year he's going to be even better than he was last season. Remember last year he really started to get it into gear. He was in the optimal lineup at the Roval. Didn't really score that many points in that race. Started around the top 10, finished around the top 10. He can do it again. Stages are going to be back. Cycling is going to be back. $8,000. He can fit in as your fifth driver if you've got a punt, and he can get you a top 10. You can get a top 10 out of your fifth pick. You've got to look at that hard. Same thing for Jesse Love. I'm not going to spend too much time clicking on his, well, oh, might as well. The thing that you're going to want to do with some of these Xfinity guys that are new and don't have a lot of experience, and he really skipped past the truck series, is look and see, okay, well, what did they do at ARCA at the road courses? And again, just because you did a little bit of extra research doesn't mean that you need to fall in love with Jesse Love. But we will do that extra research and knock this out of the park. And we'll see that. Third at Watkins Glen, fourth at Mid-Ohio. Andy has a Watkins Glen win, a fifth at Mid-Ohio. So if there's any takeaway, it's that, yeah, he has been pretty good at the road courses. And a lot of those fields are actually pretty competitive. When the Arca Series goes to, not necessarily Portland, but Watkins Glen and Mid-Ohio tend to have halfway decent fields. It's a very competitive young drivers. And so when you get top fives at a road course, it's not something that I could completely dismiss. You get a top five at an intermediate track in Kansas against equipment that just can't compete, then yeah, I don't get crazy about Jesse Love. All right, now this whole range of drivers from Sammy Smith to Cole Custer. And there's a bit of a difference in salary, but these are all top tier cars. They're all pretty talented drivers. They've all had plenty of success, as you can see. Average finishes of 17th as far as 11th. And you got Custer getting some wins. And you got Allgaier, obviously. Top fives all over the place. These are guys are going to want to target. This might be your fourth driver in, your third driver in. All of them have had success. You know, obviously the price is pretty much line up with where I would put them. Um, if I was going to boost anybody up, I think Nemechek is probably underpriced from what we have seen out of him this year in this part-time ride. It's been pretty solid, pretty stable. Good road course driver. You like him at that price. Austin Hill is probably a little underpriced as well. He's got a truck series road course win. He's got good results. He's probably a little underpriced as well and going to help you build your lineups. You can maybe go to Kligerman if he gives you more place differential. I don't think he has the upside of Nima Checker Hill. Creed's been halfway decent, but you know the story with Creed. I would be least like, less likely to roster him. 
if I can get to Allgaier, I like what he can do. Very consistent. If I can get to Custer, um, really one of the deciding factors is if these guys start a little too close to the front, I may be more inclined to roster the guys that are starting a little closer to the back. Not super excited about Chandler Smith, but he has grown as a road course driver. Not a lot of experience coming up, just an oval kid, but he's been in these series long enough that he's getting there. Last year, pretty solid at the road courses. He can get you a top 10, but, and same thing for Sammy Smith, but Anemacek more likely to get you a top five. Hill more likely to get you a top five. Same thing with these more expensive guys. And I think, but that's pretty much where the wall is going to be when we get to the next tier. We're really looking at the guys that are the favorites for the top five. So who's going to get the fifth? I like Custer, Allgaier, Hill, Nemechek the most. And then the deciding factor will probably be place differential and a point per dollar perspective. So maybe Custer starts a little bit further back, but at his price, Hill technically ends up being a little bit better of a point per dollar projection. But that's really what I am super pumped about. All these guys are in play. And we'll have to see practice and qualifying to pull the trigger. If one of them really messes up qualifying, then obviously they're going to jump to the top of the board. But those are the four that I really like from this category. The others are my secondary options. We'll have to factor in all the weekend stuff that comes into play. Uh, if I had to pick one, it's going to be, I think I would go with Austin Hill a little bit over Nemechek, but we are splitting the difference. And that's mainly due to price. Clearly, if all our customers are starting further back, they're going to be places that I want. So then we look at the top tier, all priced pretty expensively, but with the value we have at the bottom, I'm not really worried. Sam Mayer has somehow turned into this amazing road course driver. Look, one at Road America, one at Watkins Glen, one at Roval, second at Indy. Hard to ignore those numbers. Third at Portland, seventh at Coda. You can make a very strong argument that he is the best in this pack, which is pretty amazing but we cannot deny those results svg new on the scene does have one supercars race at coda so it's not completely foreign he is running double duty so he's going to get a lot of laps now driving the next gen car and the xfinity car could that throw him for a loop obviously it could but i don't think any of that says that he can't get a top five and really we are just trying to target top fives and even if he isn't the lap leader, you still have other picks to nail the lap leader. The only thing that would really turn me off is if he starts really close to the front, gets a good finish, and just doesn't point per dollar work out because there's just a better DFS play. Results wise, he can absolutely deliver. I'm not really too worried about that. But there could be someone who just scores better. And that's the same thing for all of these guys in this category. Gibbs has been absolutely great at the road courses since day one arca wins at the road courses xfinity wins at the road courses near cup wins in the road courses great car definitely in play um you know it's hard to negate him now we also have aj almondinger who's been an absolute monster and i think you gotta try to play him as much as you can he is a very strong contender to lead laps and run fast laps, although those aren't as vital. But if he's going to run laps, lead fast laps, he's more likely going to get a top three finish. He's going to maximize finishing position, and he'll be in that winning lineup because there's not a lot of points on the board. There's not a lot of fantasy points to be scored. At the end of the day, we are really targeting top fives, and we're targeting podiums. And who's better than A.J. Allmendinger? There's really no reason to not want to play A.J. Allmendinger. Same thing's going to be said of Kyle Larson. He's down here to win races. Hendrick is down here to win races. Yeah, they are trying to develop equipment and develop their drivers at road courses. Larson's going to get plenty of laps. Larson's a good road course racer. Yeah, I mean, your top three are obviously Larson, Allmendinger, and Gibbs. Don't think you can build a lineup with all three. You can definitely build a lineup with those two. Grab two from the yellow. And there's plenty of value down on the board. It's possible to squeeze three of these guys in. It could work, if you, especially if you're going to say a mayor. You just have to run the optimizer. We want to see how the practice goes. But 
if we want to get four top tens, these are the surefire top tens. These are also good solid top 10 guys. And from them, I want to maybe possibly get five if I can. If I can only get four, that's fine because there's a couple value guys that could also be really good point per dollar plays. But remember, just get in the frame of top fives and top tens, not worrying about who's going to lead laps. So if we're just running a real quick check of top fives, yes, yeah, all these guys are top five potential. SVG is probably the least likely of the crew. Uh, we want to see practice, though, and see how good his car is, how comfortable he is. But they're all very solid top fives. Then from there, if we're buying, being a little more discerning, who can be in the top five or knocking on the door? I like the guys in the bold. All are top 10 drivers. I want as many of these drivers as I can get. If I, again, were to rank, gun to my head, I'm going to take Allmendinger number one. I'm going to take Larson two, Gibbs three. It's not a huge difference, though. And Mayer, fourth. And again, he's not that far apart. Now, DFS-wise, he may be the best of the lot because he is significantly cheaper. Now, again, some of these wins weren't against the toughest fields. I don't think Mayer's faced quite the competition like this when he was winning races. And in tougher fields, he probably had a little bit poorer of results. But let's not throw any shade on a guy who just wins races. That should do it. Thanks for joining me. Like, subscribe, share the video. Hopefully it was helpful and succinct enough given the clicks to other sites. Blessed to have you around. Love you guys. Triple Light's fantastic.